Income tax 2021-2022. Itemized deductions overview. Get ready to get refunds to the max. Diving into income tax 2021-2022. Most of this information can be found on the Schedule A Instructions Tax Year 2021 found on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Here's our income tax formula focused in on the itemized deduction. In prior presentations, we looked at the income line. We looked at the adjustments to income, which could also be called the above the line deductions, deductions for adjusted gross income or Schedule 1 deductions. And then we have the adjusted gross income subtotal. And then we have our deductions down below taking the greater of the standard deduction or itemized deduction meaning we always have to compare and contrast those two to get down to the taxable income remember that this top half of the formula is in essence a modified or tax income statement and an income statement in essence is just going to be income minus the expenses to get to basically net income so this is kind of like the equivalent of net income for our income tax system which we're going to apply the tax on we want to keep distinct the adjustments up top which you can also think of as above the line deductions from these items down below and then these items down below the standard deduction and itemized deduction we have to look at the relationship between them so we can understand what the is going to happen with regards to the tax return and give some tax planning and if we're taking on clients this is going to be important to get a grasp of the complexity of the tax return so we could focus on those returns that we have chosen to focus in on preparing so note that this can is like a confusing line up top the adjustments to income because you could call it an above the line deductions or deductions for adjusted gross income so why would they call them adjustments to income because really remember that this line item down below the adjusted gross income the agi is often what is used when you think about income phase outs for things like credits and deductions so these above the line deductions are deductions that are going to have an impact on the agi the adjusted gross income which is typically the number that is going to be used to to uh, calculate phase outs on expenses and credits so you might call it an adjustment to income a lowering of income like a reversal of income like kind of a contra income account as opposed to a deduction but in essence with regards to the decrease of the line item it's going to do the same thing in other words a deduction you can call this a deduction or you can call it an adjustment to income it's going to lower basically the bottom line the net income in essence getting us to the adjusted gross income the deductions down below whether they be the standard deduction or the itemized deductions obviously are not going to have an impact on the adjusted gross income they're going to have an impact on the bottom line which is the taxable income so these deductions down below are not going to have an impact on like the phase out kind of calculations that are going to be taking place with regards to certain deductions and uh, certain credits so you want to keep those things kind of distinct in your mind and then whenever we think about the itemized deductions we also we always have to compare it to the standard deduction because the only time that we would take the itemized deduction is if it was higher than the standard deduction because remember that with taxes everything is reversed we want to look bad we want the taxable income to be low in other words if i was to talk to someone normally about income income's usually a good thing right you can go overboard you could be greedy or whatnot but income is typically good if you wanted to get a loan or something like that you would want to look good to try to impress the loan that you can repay the loan and and get money for whatever you want to do but for taxes income is bad because obviously as income goes up you have you have to pay more taxes because the iris wants to tax you at, at the higher income so that means that the deductions are good which again it's kind of weird because usually expenses from a normal sense are bad the more expenses if you're spending too much it's usually bad but here the expenses are good in essence those being the deduction so we want the higher deduction so if the standard deduction is higher than the itemized deduction we're going to take the standard deduction now a couple of years ago they actually increased the standard deduction and that made it so a lot less people are going to itemize the rationale i believe for doing that was to try to simplify the code because if everyone just took a standard deduction based on like the filing status and a couple other things that would make the tax return a lot easier the itemized deductions are usually going to benefit people who are more well off because they're going to have more kind of things that fall into that category of itemized deductions some of the largest being things like mortgage interest 
and things like the property tax on the home, which you might think, well, everybody should have a home and own the home and have property tax. And, but even if you have an average sized home, <laughs> you might not be giving as big a benefit as if you had a multi-million dollar home with a loan taken out on it or multi, you know, two homes or something like that, where that's, you know, obviously then the, the itemized deductions can get a lot higher uh, quite quickly. So, you, so we always have to be comparing these two things. And this is important when we do, if we're working in the field of taxation, we want to be, be determining what level of tax return we want to be working on. If we're trying to crank out as many tax returns as possible, possibly then using the automation of tax returns, trying to take the data input forms, the W-2s, the 1099s, and use the fancy new technology and the softwares. We can scan the forms and whatnot and try to get the tax uh, return done basically automatically with that kind of stuff, then you're, you're not going to be able to do that as easily with returns that are itemized because they're usually going to be more complex because they're usually going to be higher income uh, individuals. So that'll be an indication that you're working with a more uh, complex return if they are itemizing. And or are you working in a situation where you really want to take on people that are itemizing, typically people that have higher income levels and more complex returns, ones where you can't automate the whole process, where you can't just throw the tax, you know, the actual documentation into a scanner and have the return do a lot of it in and of itself because it's too complicated to do that. Usually in that case, you have more complex returns, more research, more tax planning that could take place on it, and you often have higher profit margins. So that's kind of the trade-off from the tax preparation standpoint. In order to determine if someone's going to itemize or not, you got to have an idea of their filing status. So if they're, if they're married filing single, you got to know, okay, if they're married filing, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, if they're uh, just if they're single, then you got to say, okay, what's the standard deduction if they're single and how many itemized deductions would I need in order to take me over that cap to where it would be beneficial to add up the itemized deductions? Because if I don't have enough itemized deductions to take, then it might not be worthwhile to ask my client, hey, pick up, go, go find all of your medical expenses that you spent all year and stuff like that. Uh, if you don't need that information because you're not going to be able to itemize because you're going to be taking the standard deduction. So it's a it's good idea to have a general idea of that. Obviously, if they're married, then the standard deduction is typically going to be doubled. Head of household is typically going to be somewhere in between. So let's take a look at this is going to be the first page of the form 1040. We're looking here on line uh, 12A where we have the 22.5. Now notice what 12A says. It says standard deduction or itemized deduction from Schedule A. So it's going to take either or just like we saw in our formula up top. One of these two are going to be taken. You can look on the left hand side and see that the for a single or married filing separate individual, you've got the 12,550 for the, the, the uh, standard deduction. So that means if they were filing, filing single or married filing separately, they would have to have higher itemized deductions than that threshold, the 12,550 in order to itemize. And by the way, married filing separately could have added complications because if, if one person is filing, you know, out for the itemized deduction and the other was not, so you have kind of an added complication there. But generally, if single, the, the th cutoff is going to be that 12,550. And then you could double it if they're married. So if they're married, you would double that to, to the 25,100. So they would have to have itemized deductions over that in order to be able to itemize. So if they're not close to these amounts, then, th then and they ask you, well, should I, should I be adding up all of my, my medical uh, costs and so on? If they're not close to that, it might not be worth doing it. If you are somewhat close to that, then it might be worth adding those up and checking it out. If it's head of household, you're in between at the 18,800. Now also just realize what's the thing that mostly pushes people over to being able to take the itemized deduction. It's usually when they own a home. So if they don't own a home, it's likely that they're not gonna be pushed over because the thing that pushes most people over to being able to itemize is the fact that they have a lot of mortgage interest possibly and they have the state taxes with regards to property taxes, two huge uh, itemized deductions. Those are the things that often push people over the threshold. So in general, if they don't own a home, unless there's something more, you know, an unusual thing going on, your default assumption would be possibly they're not going to itemize. If you're taking on a new client, 
then what you want to do is ask about that. You want to get a feel for how complex their return is. Did you itemize last year? Do you own a home? Right? Those are the kind of questions that are going to help you to determine how complex uh, the return will be. And also just realize with regards to the itemized deductions, you'll often get questions with those big itemized deductions like, you know, should I buy a, should I buy a home given the fact that I get this deduction? And obviously if you talk to real estate brokers or something like that who are in the business of selling homes, they're gonna say the government wants you to buy the home because they give you this big deduction. And you get that deduction, but it actually, it actually complicates things more than I think simplifies it. It's another area where if they never put the deduction in, then what would happen is the market would adjust around the more simple regulations. After they put the deduction in, you would think what happens in the long run is the home prices go up in order to compensate for the for the added, you know, regulation that goes up. So is it, you know, kind of baked into the price and that kind of stuff is a is basically an open uh, type of question. But what you what you want to make clear is the fact that if you're buying a home to get the deduction, you might not be getting the full deduction uh, related to the interest because the difference between where you were at before with this and and the cap at the standard deduction isn't really a benefit for you. So in other words, let's say that you got a ten thousand dollar interest that you would that you would be paying uh, for the home. But let's say that you're a single filer and you only had like six six thousand itemized deductions. So, so now buying the home would push you over to being able to itemize. But if you were only at 6,000 before and the cap for, for was 12,550 that you're going to get, then there's 12,550 minus the 6,000. That's 6,550 that you were already getting without the home, right? And then if, if the home allowed you more itemized deductions of another $10,000, well, 6,550, you were already basically getting because it was baked into the standard deduction so you'd have to subtract that out minus the ten thousand and you're really only getting an added benefit of the three thousand four fifty so it's a bit more complex than than just saying i'm gonna get i'm gonna get to deduct the full ten thousand which is my taxes and my my mortgage interest because if you're not already itemizing then you're probably got a standard deduction that has a pretty good space or gap between your current itemized deductions. So really the best way to do it, if, if that's gonna be an influential factor and it could be for a home purchase, is to run actual projections uh, with tax software so you can get a, an actual feel what the savings will be by running mock tax returns and running projections. Okay, so then we've got the itemized deduction which is gonna be reported on Schedule A. You got the major categories on the left-hand side and in future presentations, we'll go into some of those categories in more depth. You can obviously look at the instructions for the Schedule A if you got any questions about a particular item within the itemized deductions. So this is the standard deduction and a bit more complex here on the standard deduction. Remember the left-hand side are your standard deductions for single filers, married filing, joint head of household. And on the right-hand side, we have those added kind of components uh, that would be in place if someone was was older over the age limit to increase the standard deduction and if they were blind for example then you can have those increases in the standard deduction which again you want to keep those kind of in mind have those in mind as you're thinking about whether or not someone's going to benefit from the itemized deductions or not so itemized deductions overview if you itemize you can deduct a part of your medical and dental expenses and amounts you paid for certain taxes, interest, contributions, and other expenses. You can also deduct certain casualty and theft losses. If you and your spouse paid expenses jointly and are filing separate returns for 2021, see publication 504 to figure the portion of joint expenses that you can claim as itemized deductions. So then we have uh, don't include on Schedule A items deducted elsewhere, such as Form 1040, Form 1040S, R, or Schedule C, E, or F. So in other words, clearly, if you're taking the deduction in uh, some other area, you can't also take that same deduction in general on the Schedule A. So for example, if you had the mortgage interest and you, had, you used part of your home for a business and you deducted it say on the schedule c you can't also deduct it basically on the schedule a you'd have to allocate it uh, appropriately now again also realize that if you're married filing joint 
and you file a separate return, uh, you, you're, I'm sorry, if you're married and you choose rather than filing married filing joint to file married filing separate, then the itemized deductions can kind of be a confusing component because the IRS is going to be skeptical that a married couple uh, purposely tries to file married filing separate in order to maximize both the itemized deductions and then take the standard deduction on the other spouse's return. So, so there could be limitations there. That's another area where that married filing separate could run into kind of complexities or problems there. For that, you could take a look at publication 504, which you could find on the IRS website for a little bit more detail on it. So what's new? Personal protective equipment, PPE, amounts paid for PPE such as masks, hand sanitizer, and sanitizing wipes for the primary purpose of preventing the spread of coronavirus are qualified medical expenses. If the amounts were paid or reimbursed under a health flexible spending arrangement, Archer Medical Savings Account, health reimbursement arrangement, or any other health plan, the amounts are not deductible on Schedule A. So you, you've got those added, which before this point in time possibly would, wouldn't be like, you know, medical related items. So standard mileage rates, the standard mileage rate allowed for operating expenses for a car when you use it for medical reasons decreased to 16 cents a mile. The 2021 rate for use of your vehicle uh, to, to volunteer work for certain charitable organizations remains at 14 cents a mile. So this is when we're calculating basically a mileage rate and it could the mileage rate could differ based on on what type of deduction that we're looking into.